Okay, let's do a full case now, right? Okay. Okay, we're going to do a case again in the automotive sector because I want you to know about this sector just in case it comes up, right? Okay, yeah. Let's assume that this is based, it's a real case as well. It's in the press all the time, so you can probably apply what you know there. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that Tesla wants to lower battery costs for its cars. The battery cost in a Tesla is one of the biggest cost contributors, which drives up the price of the car, right? Yes. So now Tesla needs to make two decisions. The first decision is, should they focus on reducing battery costs or the rest of the other costs in the car? So let's assume the average Tesla costs $70,000, right? Mm -hmm. They're thinking, should we lower the costs in the rest of the car to bring the overall cost of the car down? Or should we lower the cost for batteries to bring the overall cost of the car down? Okay. Could you repeat that again? So there's two ways to lower the cost of the overall car, right? Yeah. One is to lower the cost of batteries. Mm -hmm. The other one is to lower the cost of everything else in the car besides the batteries. Okay. If you, both options will bring the overall cost down. Mm -hmm. Understand. Now, if you decide to go for either option, how would you do it? Okay. Yes. Um, may I have a moment to think about this? Okay, Michael. Mm -hmm. um, so if I get the... Uh, the agenda here. Um, the question is about lowering the costs, and there are two ways of lowering the cost. The first one is to lower the cost of the battery, and the second one is to, low, uh, to lower all the other costs besides uh, besides the battery. So my um, where I stand here is that uh, the objective is uh, obvious because te Tesla is a um, electric company car to uh, maintain um, their um, to maintain their cars running and the battery is a key element in in this so as i am not uh, very familiar with the batteries and how to lower the cost while keeping the same um, the same um, efficiency on the battery uh, and also because i think that it's the main point of the company i would go for the uh, second option that is to lower all the other costs uh, beside the battery. So explain to me the reasoning around why not the other, why, why everything else but the battery? Okay, so the first one, uh, there's there, there would be two reasons. Uh, the first one would be that I am not, um, I think that the battery is pretty much uh, uh, what they can find. I, I mean, like in terms of efficiency and price, I'm not sure that it can get a cheaper battery that has the exact same efficiency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as they have today, and because the battery is is a is what um, makes the, the the car working, I think it would be a uh, dangerous bet to um, to switch to other um, other battery um, battery um, um, battery people who would mm -hmm. <laughs> battery company. Um, as it might uh, have some impacts on both um, the efficiency of the car, but also on production, because they might have some delays or some things to reorganize. So I think that the easiest way to achieve the, um, and that's the second reason, that the easiest way to achieve the uh, the target is actually to bring down the other costs and to see if they can be efficient on other costs. Okay, let's work on the other costs then. Okay, so um, if um, I look at the, all the other costs, I would have um, to have to to, uh, to 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 level here. Um, I would have first the fixed costs, mm -hmm. and secondly the the variable costs. Mm -hmm. So I would think that um, the um, automotive industry is quite uh, variable costs heavy. Mm -hmm. Um, especially in those cars, in those kind of company where they're quite niche and working on a very um, mid high level cars that have a lot of uh, research and design in it. Mm -hmm. So I would um, consider that's the, the that's the main point I would focus on. And on those uh, on the variable costs, I would have to establish the list of the costs. Um, and I would focus mostly on first the uh, labor costs and secondly on the materials related costs. Um, I would um, first tackle the labor costs and try to understand how the labor costs are um, in the company today. Are they uh, where do they produce? Do they produce in 
in a heavy labor cost country? And is there an opportunity either to automatize, 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 automate, automate mm-hmm. uh, the, the processes to have less people or to think about producing or assembling the car in, in another country? Okay, so, so, okay. so are you saying that you're saying that it's very you saying it's very it has a high variable cost? I would think so. Do you think labor is a fixed or a variable cost? I think it's the I am talking about the labor that is directly working on the cars, so I would assume it's depending on how many cars you make. Okay. So you think it's, you think labor is a variable cost, yeah. Uh, here, yes. Do you think that an auto industry is highly capital intensive or is a high fixed cost or a high variable cost industry? For the cars? Yeah, so, so auto manufacturing of cars. Do you think that this is a, an industry where they, you incur high capital cost to begin? Yeah, to begin you need high. So this is a, high ca- this is a highly capital intensive industry, right? Okay. Now, so to begin you need high capex spend, which means your fixed costs are higher. Mm-hmm. Now, the only time you could say variable costs are higher is if you've de- fully depreciated your fixed costs, right? Yes, okay. Now, what do we know about Tesla that we can to allow us to infer if they've fully depreciated their fixed costs or not? Two things we can know about them, just without even knowing anything about them. Um, I would probably have the, the, the price of their cars. No, not really. I was thinking, okay. I'll, give you, I'll help you with one. One is they're a young company. One is that? They are a younger company. A younger company, okay. And probably they're, okay, so um, the market they're evolving in is is growing. It's quite new also, a niche. Yeah, so close. If you're a young company, you don't have, you would not have had enough time to fully depreciate your fixed costs. Mm-hmm. Two, if you're in a growing industry, which means you have to incur investments to grow, you are incurring new investments, which means by default, you don't have enough time to fully depreciate them. Okay. Yeah. So... One thing I would have looked for here is, well, we haven't finished the case, don't worry, but I just want you to be more clear about that, right? Mm-hmm. Use yeah. more about what you can infer to fix, to pinpoint area. So labor is unlikely to be a high variable cost. Mm-hmm. Labor is only a variable cost in industries where time is the thing you are selling, like law, accounting, and management consulting. Okay. In every other industry, it's fixed. where the product that you are selling is not time, then you are essentially a high fixed cost industry. Mm, okay. Which also explains now that you are not married. One day you're going to be searching to find someone to marry. When you, if you want to marry a doctor, let's just assume you're going to marry a doctor, right? Mm-hmm. You should only marry a doctor who is so highly specialized that he can charge a lot for his time. Okay. It's the same principle. If he's just got basic skills, then he's going to be paid based on the number of people he sees. Mm-hmm. Like a general practitioner. I think France has government subsidized medicine, right? Yes. In that case, the way it probably works is that you go see a doctor and the doctor charges the government. Um, you go see the doctor, you pay the doctor, and then the government reimburses you. Okay, so similar, right? But the point there is that a lot of them doctors just get the degree and they just work for the government. Yes. But the problem with that model is that that is a high variable cost model. To get paid, you have to see crime. Yes, true. Mm-mm. A very you know, specialized doctor who's like a brilliant at doing heart surgeries maybe gets flown to Los Angeles once every month and charges a fortune to fix Tom Cruise's heart or something. I don't know. <laughs> only in America. It's a similar principle, right? Okay, yeah. So labor is only a variable cost if time is what you are selling. Mm-hmm. In the automotive industry, you're not really selling time. Okay. But if, if it's... Okay, I thought that if it's related to the, the um, productive, productivity directly, the, the, the people, that, the labor that is working directly on the, on the products you're making, it would be counting as... A... You are right there. You are 100% right. But remember, the, the question isn't whether la- variable cost is high. Yeah. The question is whether variable cost is higher than fixed then. cost. Mm-hmm. Variable cost will always rise. Labor cost will always rise a little as production rises. Okay. But what we want to see is that does labor, does labor cost directly mimic production? And it wouldn't. Because if Tesla wants to make more cars, they can change something in production without hiring so many more people, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So labor will follow Tesla's production costs, but it won't perfectly follow. It. Okay. It's not perfectly synchronized. Mm-hmm. And because it's such a highly fixed cost industry, even if labor directly followed production, labor is such a small component of total costs that it doesn't matter to us. Okay. So I should... Okay. Mm. Yeah, just put it this way. To make more of something, you don't need to hire and say more people because there'll be spare capacity in production and in labor force. Mm-hmm. 
Make sense? Yes. Okay, now you wanted to look at labor because you said that it would be the biggest component. Now, the thing I would have liked you to have done a little bit better is to better brainstorm fixed and variable costs. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. I didn't feel you broke it down very well. I think you kind of like wanted to talk about labor, so you turned it into a labor discussion, mm -hmm. as opposed to brainstorming it and prioritizing it. For me, if I had to, if I had to ask you to brainstorm, let's say variable costs for Tesla, what would you say are the variable costs? Variable costs. Mm. So variable costs are the, are the costs that change as the unit volume of car production changes, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I would have the labor, well, labor, as we talked, um, mm -hmm. the materials, Good. Uh, costs. Mm, I would probably also have the uh, cost related to uh, stock inventory. Yeah, but that's the same as material, right? Okay. So remember, you get two kinds of material. You get finished goods inventory, which is the finished car sitting and waiting to be shipped. And the, the raw material. And then you get working capital, working capital, which is inventory that you have sitting in the factory before it's made into a car. Okay, that wasn't very clear for me. Do you want me to repeat, repeat it? Yeah. Okay, so let's assume you have a factory, right? Mm -hmm. And you're making cars. Yeah. Now, you need to buy aluminium to make the car body, right? Yes. So you buy the aluminium and it's waiting in your warehouse before it's used to make the car. Yes. We call that working capital. Oh, okay. So also known as, as a working capital inventory or unfinished inventory, unprocessed inventory. Mm -hmm. It is money you spend to buy things that go into your final product before it goes into your final product. Okay. Once, it, once your final product is made and before you get payment from a customer, it's called finished goods inventory. Okay. Right? Because obviously Tesla can't charge you until they give you the car, right? Mm -hmm. Except I think Tesla does charge you before they give you the car. They make you put a $5,000 deposit or something like that. But the full price of the car, they can't get it from you until you receive the car. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I would have both. Mm -hmm. I think on the, on the variable cost. Now, what if I told you that Tesla mm -hmm. has a hugely optimistic view of sales in 2016? Which one do you think would be higher? Finished goods inventory or working capital, unfinished goods inventory? So they, they have an optimistic view as, of how much cars as to they how sell. much they would sell. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, well, I would say... I, my, my understanding here is that it will depend on... on much more on their production capacity. So, for example, they can buy a lot of working, uh, like a lot of raw materials and stock them. But if they don't have the um, the process or the production capacity, I want to help you, Archie. I'm not going to give you the answer, but I'm going to help you to think about it. Okay? Yes. I'm basically asking you to brainstorm you, yeah. mm -hmm. but I'm doing it without saying the words. I'm basically, you have to ask yourself, let's brainstorm why Tesla would have a lot of working capital if they think they would have more sales, right? Yes. That's what I'm asking you to do. Do you see that? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So why So why does a company a need to buy a lot of material? When do companies do that? When they're, when they're in need of... Uh, when they... Once you have control over their inventory and not be in shortage of raw materials. You have, to, you have to brainstorm, yeah. Brainstorm. Oh, I have to brainstorm. What drives brainstorm. huge inventory purchases? That's what I'm asking you to do. Um, the, the demand? Yeah. A lot of confirmed. Well, you have demand or confirmed orders. They're both different. You can have a lot of demand but no confirmed orders or you can have demand with confirmed orders, right? Okay. So I would have the... So one possibility is Tesla actually has confirmed orders. Mm-hmm. But companies, do, do you think companies like spending money on inventory? Not really. No, no one wants to tie up all the capital in inventory because it's not like you can return it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question then becomes, why would Tesla feel the need to actually buy up inventory before it needs it? Well, if it's not really directly on, on, on the demand side, I would have to look at the supply side, probably because they have a better opportunity to buy a big a huge amount of aluminium, for example, for a special price. Okay, discounts, right? That's a very good reason. You buy in bulk because you can secure a big discount. What's the other reasons? Um, probably also the, another reason would be the price that you have today on the market. And maybe you have studies that predict that this price would good. go up. So you think if demand is going up, there'll be more people that want it. Okay, what's the third reason? The, yeah. Um, so I have... Um, I'm not, I'm not very sure. It's okay. Sure. 
So uh, let's just step back, right? So we wanted to know under what conditions would a company buy a lot of inventory. We said that uh, one thing to look at is the demand side issues and the other side is supply side issues, right? Good breakdown. Mm-hmm. I thought that was good. And the demand side, either a perceived demand is high or actual orders are high, right? Yes. On the supply side, maybe you could get a bulk purchase, a discount. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Today's price is higher than tomorrow's price. Yeah. And also that... Third is maybe there's just not enough of it on the market. You want to lock it in early. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I was going coming to that. <laughs> what do you think is a fourth one there you to consider? A fourth one. Um, said this question. Um, it's no, I don't think I no, I don't know. I okay, have... so let's assume you go to a. Okay. Let's assume you go to a restaurant, right? Yes. What is your favorite dish in the whole world? Um, I don't really have one, so. What do you really like eating? Really like, I don't know, pasta, let's say pasta. Pasta, okay, pasta. Yeah. Let's assume you go to a restaurant and you ask them to make you this amazing pasta, right? Mm-hmm. And it, it's hard to make it, so they, but they do it for you, right? Yes. What would it take for the restaurant to put it on their menu? Considering you're one of the few people in the world who likes this, what would it take for the restaurant to put it on their menu? Um, if it's something that only a few people in the world like, mm-hmm. right? Um, um, I, I'm not sure if they can secure the the uh, pro, um. the answer here is that sometimes someone will only manufacture something that is unique if they get a large enough order. Yeah. If you're buying specialized stuff, you're usually the only market for it, right? Yes. Which means that no one is going to make all the changes to manufacture it unless they get a confirmed large order. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Yes. I don't know much about Tesla. I've never seen those cars anywhere. Uh, but I would assume that some of the stuff they make is quite specialized. Probably. So you see the differences on the supply side. There are quite a few of them, right? Mm-hmm. Now, the case will continue where we'll go out and break it. What do you think is the most important one we have to focus on? Yeah. So we know inventory is a big issue, right? Yes. Why do we think, why is working capital inventory more important than finished goods inventory? Why is it more important? Yeah, in this particular case. Can you infer why it's more important? Because I I, I would assume that the materials they use uh, or they need to buy are quite specialized because they're doing, or quite... No, because demand is high. Expensive. You know okay. the cars that are waiting in the warehouse are going to be shipped anyway. Mm-hmm. There's no issue there. Yeah, okay. So even if your work, even if your finished goods inventory is high, it's only a problem because you want to ship them out fast enough to get paid because you lose interest, right? Mm-hmm. But you're not really concerned that they're sitting on a lot and no one's ever going to buy them. Yeah, it's not like a Ford, right? Mm-hmm. You know, if a Ford car is sitting on a lot, there's a concern that maybe people will never buy. It. Okay. Right. Now, let's just change the case a little bit. You didn't focus on batteries, right? Yes. Because you didn't ask a very important question. The two, the three questions you have to ask yourself in the beginning of the case was, what percentage is battery contribution to the overall cost? Mm -hmm. If it's only 5%, no matter what you do with batteries, you can't lower it by more than 5%. Mm -hmm. Do you see that logic? Yes. So if batteries were 30% of the total cost and you want to lower the total cost by 10%, then you may look at batteries, right? Mm-hmm. So you got to ask yourself, how much is batteries likely to be of the overall cost of the car? And therefore, okay. what is the likely reduction we can get here? And how big is it going to be for the total cost of the car? Mm-hmm. So if batteries were 50% of the total car cost, right? 50%, okay. And you lowered, yeah, 50%. Okay. And you lowered battery cost by 50%, that means the overall car cost would only lower by 25%. Mm-hmm. If batteries were only 5% and you lowered it by, let's say, 80%, you'd still only strip out 4% from the total car cost. Okay. So that logic was missing at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Then you have to ask yourself the next question. If batteries are a big car, is a big cost, is there mm-hmm. a belief that you can strip out more efficiencies here? Yeah. Yeah? Yes. Third question is, do you have control over the cost? What do you mean by that? Well, if you're in a very specialized industry where there's not a lot of suppliers, oh, okay, then yes. you can't really force competition mm-hmm. whereby people would bid for better designs. Yes, okay. And, and even if you're, it's not just if you're in a very specialized industry, if you're a small industry, Tesla is really tiny, right? Mm-hmm. Which is one reason they talk so much about orders they're getting. Do you know why they do that? Not really. They want more suppliers to enter the market. Oh, okay. Because at the moment, if they, just, if they always tell everyone they're a niche company, how many mm-hmm. suppliers do you think would enter the market? Not many more. And how much then leverage do you think Tesla would have on negotiating pricing? Then none. Almost none, right? Yeah. It's always in the interest of Elon Musk and so on to talk about volumes because mm. it's good for them. They encourage big scale players to enter the market. 
Yeah, okay. And if a big scale player enters the market, costs start falling, and then the overall cost of the car drops. Mm-hmm. Which is why you never find someone in a highly labor intensive, in a highly fixed cost intensive sector talking about how the fact they don't want more suppliers. They like the suppliers. You'll never see that. Okay. They want more suppliers, more competition, drive down prices, and then they, because in a highly fixed cost industry, as competi- as the prices, as the costs drop, you then distribute your profits over smaller costs, which means your margin goes up. Okay. Make sense? Yes. Okay, let's stop there, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, how do you think you did in that one? Mm, not very... No, not very good. <laughs> I didn't think you did very well because you didn't dig. Okay. You kind of missed the logic of how you pick which one to focus on, right? Mm-hmm. And you didn't have to know anything about electric cars and batteries to know that. Yeah. It's just logic. You'd focus on the biggest costs, whether you would have control over it, right? Yeah. And whether there's enough supplies in the market, because even if there's, you know, if there's only one, if there's one supplier, you don't have any leverage. No one, they know that you can't go anywhere else. If there's two, maybe you can go somewhere else. If three, highly unlikely, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now. From that point on, when we started breaking down fixed and variable costs, you kind of mixed up fixed and variable costs. Okay. In terms of where labor should sit. Yes. Yeah? Mm, Yeah. Then from that point on, when we started understanding the economics of, you know, how batteries would work and why they want to lower the price, you didn't really understand that, right? Mm -hmm. You didn't understand why you know, volume is so important, why they're trying to lower the price on batteries, how they would do it, why they need more supplies and so on. I didn't expect you to know any of these things, but I would want you to infer a little infer. bit better. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So none of these things I expect you to know, but your inference skills have to be a little bit better, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's do a, any questions on that. No. <laughs> So the solution to this case is to first determine how big a contribution batteries are. Can they be controlled? Who controls them, right? Mm-hmm. You know, R&D is actually a fixed cost, not a variable cost. Yes. So if you're investing money in R&D, you're basically pushing up your fixed cost. Mm-hmm. Once you then realize batteries are so big, you then try to figure out how do we lower the cost here. Mm-hmm. Overall, you, you need to lower the cost in two ways. One, well, there's only one way to get volume up. Yes. But to get volume up, you need to sell more cars, right? Mm-hmm. But you can't sell more cars until you lower the cost of batteries. Okay. So how yeah. do you fix that chicken and egg problem? <laughs> Very good question. You get a scale player to enter the market to make the batteries, right? Well, yeah. So then when they so they build a big factory, they make batteries cheaply. Because the batteries are cheap, the overall price of the car is cheap, mm-hmm. which means more cars are sold and you use the batteries you manufacture. Do you see that? Yes. I uh, okay. Does it make sense? Yes, it does. I was just wondering like the battery they're using, they might be they might have a lot of R and D inside it. I don't see how they can say like, oh, we're just gonna externalize it because my my understanding or my hypothesis here is that the battery is very it's is actually at the core of their business mm-hmm. and it's probably something they've patented. I don't know if you say that. You're right, it is at the core of the business, but that doesn't mean they have to make it. But it's okay, that's that's come back to the discussion we had about outsourcing and yeah. and all this. So what they have to do here is they have to get it costs a lot of money to invest in the R and D and to get the scale up, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You need a partner to do that when you're a niche player. Mm-hmm. Okay. You need a partner with someone who's willing to build a huge factory, get volumes down. But this plan only works if the batteries you made in big, in massive volume will be used. Mm-hmm. If they are not used, your entire plan fails and you have to write off a lot of debt. So another way of saying this is that they make building a huge factory, making a lot of batteries, right? Very cheaply. Yeah. Mm-hmm. With the expectation that those batteries will be used. Okay. They need to be very yeah. confident that their cars are so amazing that if they can find a way to lower the cost of the batteries and then lower the overall cost of the car, the cars would sell. If they are wrong, then all of the costs they incurred to build those huge battery facilities, they will not be able to recover it. Mm-hmm. And they go bankrupt. Okay. Yeah. Just in, in consulting or in, in business, we call this a game of chance. Have you heard this? Not really. Well, no. I think it's actually called a game of confidence, not a game of chance. So in high fixed cost industries, you have to be supremely confident you will be able to sell the volume you're producing. So the key thing is, is you make the batteries, you don't know if you'll sell it, but you're confident. You make them assuming you'll sell them, but you can only know once you've sold them or after you've made them. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Yeah. So here... Starting could have been better and understanding how to prioritize batteries, understanding of labor costs and fixed costs, variable costs could have been better. Knowing how the economics of batteries work, why it's so important, how to lower it, and then knowing how to infer things better mm-hmm. on fixed costs and variable costs. Yeah. Okay. And that's it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed doing the episode. 
Finally, I want you to remember that the only way to get access to our special offers, the only way to get our special pricing, and the only way to get samples of our content is to join the list on firmsconsulting.com. It's the only way also to get access to our unique advanced content that we make available to insiders. So if you want to get a sneak peek of things, test it out, see what's in there, this is the place to go. And finally, I want to thank you again for making us one of the largest podcast channels around the world for careers and for the 2 million downloads and counting.